It's a great, great place, great people. God puts us through things, and we go through things for a reason. Let's find out what they are. Let's not sit down and despair and worry about what was. Let's worry about what is and what is to come. Amen? God has kept us here. God has put us here. God will keep us here. This is not my church. This isn't Jack Hiles' church. This wasn't Jack Scott's church. This is God's church. Let us serve it rightly. Let us stay faithful to it. And let it stay by the stuff. And I'm in. I hope you are as well. And it was great. It's great music this morning. My soul has been challenged by the music. And if you sit there and the songs don't get to you, there's something wrong with you. Music doesn't speak to your soul through the congregational singing and through the voices of the groups and the choir, soloists. Something's wrong. Come to church to get something. Don't let this become a ritual to you. And by the way, we'll meet again tonight if you're interested. You're going to hear Brother George Ramp tonight. Hear his testimony. And he deserves to be heard tonight. You need to be here for it. I'll be preaching the Sunday morning messages every Sunday until we elect a pastor. But I'll be having different men speak in the uh, evening services and Wednesday evening services, and I'll announce those to you. But uh, I want you to be here. I want you to rally behind the men that are preaching. Amen. Rally behind the musicians that work so hard to make what they do so powerful and uh, heart-changing. And I want you to pr pray throughout the week. That's what we're going to talk about today. Prayer. How many have been praying? Raise your hand. Me too. We need to pray. So often we look at prayer as something, well, pray for you, brother. Yeah. And we don't really mean it. It's just, a, it's just like saying, you know, how you doing? Pray for you, brother. Pray for you, sister. We've got to take that literally right now. Yeah. I've received, a, if I said thousands, I might be exaggerating, but close to it, of text and emails and messages that people are praying for us. And if God doesn't do something for us and do something with us, he is ignoring us on purpose because God's, a lot of people are trying to get his attention. And so let's be faithful to the people of this country, to our friends, our loved ones, our college students, the pastors of those students. God wants to do something with us. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the music. Holy Spirit, we need you now. Rest on each and every person here. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you help us to understand the message. May it work in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I asked you a second ago if you prayed. Pray this week. I think most all of you raised your hand. At least most everybody that I can see raised their hand. Prayer is important. We see prayer as something that we all participate in. Many of us not as often as others, and many seem to have a better handle on prayer than others do. Some seem to take prayer on as something that it's their calling in life to do is to pray. God calls us all to pray, but some seem to be more versed into it than others. You can't help at this time of the year to be watching the Olympics. And you may have noticed... Uh, uh, Michael Phelps has taken just about all the medals that I think they've made, and uh, I think he's running in track and field this week, too. <laughs> he might as well. He's just on a roll. He ought to take them. But you see these athletes that have, they're not just athletes. They're not just uh, people that put on a uniform. They seem to be into what they're doing at a far greater uh, pace, at a far greater intensity than anybody else. There are athletes in this room, and, and uh, maybe you get together with your buddies and you play some basketball on Tuesday night or, or uh, Friday night or something, and, and uh, you like to play basketball, but you know what? You, you, don't, you don't live and eat and breathe basketball anymore. When I was, when I was young, I, uh, I loved to play in Little League. I was in St. John Little League. And uh, I, I lived for it. I, I loved it. We had a field up the street from our house that we, the older guys, got together and, and they uh, mowed it down. It was a farmer's field and we mowed it down and he never planted uh, or plowed that portion of the field. And we, it was just a big enough size that we could make a baseball field in it. 
And uh, we, uh, we pulled our own money together from lawn mowing and allowances to buy baseballs for it. And because if you hit one out of the field, literally it went into a, a field that wasn't mowed. And uh, you lost a lot of them that way. But it, it became a passion for us. Then the, the studying baseball and watching the Cubs play and taking it in the baseball cards and following in the newspaper. And uh, I lived three miles from St. John, but I played in the St. John Little League and I riding my bike there. I mean, I'd put my uniform on as soon as I could that day and ride to St. John. I just lived for the days that we were, it was game time. And I can honestly say as a child, I was into baseball. And I played church softball for, for over 25 years, and I enjoyed that. And Saturday night, it was fun, but I wouldn't say that I was into softball. I didn't eat and breathe and sleep softball. There are some of you guys uh, in high school, maybe, and basketball is all that's in your mind. You've seen even the guys that are on the team. You know, they're, 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 you know just because everybody's got a uniform on doesn't mean that everybody's really into it. Some guys make the team because they like being on a team and they like basketball. But there's always some that really get into it more than everybody else. Yeah. I wrestled in high school. I suffered from a debilitating disease of shortness. And uh, I realized that I wasn't going to overcome that. Now, I bet not by any, any uh, miracle or anything. And I realized where do short fat kids go? And that's where <laughs> wrestling, that's where I went. Dr. Staub was my coach, and, and I got into it. He'll, he'll vouch for it. We got into it. Me and Matt Burkert and a few others, we, uh, we got into wrestling. We got into the sport to where it consumed us, to where going to practices was not, that wasn't a pain, and to do all the exercises. When he turned his back, a lot of guys would slack off and wouldn't run as hard. We ran harder. We were just into it. We were possessed by it. It was something that we wanted to accomplish and wanted to be good at. There are those that are into, into uh, music and those that, uh, they, you know, if I were to ask for a raise of hands here of how many have taken piano lessons and could play the piano, many hands would go up. But many of you who play the piano haven't played it in months or maybe years or maybe since you were a child. You like music and you love to sing and you love to hear the singing a while ago, but you're not into music. You hear, uh, you see our orchestra play, and these are folks that have really studied the, 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 the craft. And you, you hear Pat White sometimes and play an offertory for us. And now she, she plays an instrument, but she, you can tell she's into music. You can hear her play on the, the cello, and you can actually almost hear the words being sung. She, she, she puts herself so in, into it. Brother Matthewson, you know, he's not just a singer. He got into it this morning. The choir, you heard them. They got into it this morning. They weren't just singing a song. They were into the song. Are you into prayer? Are you into prayer? I want you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke. I want you to just to look at a couple passages with me. Luke chapter 6, if you would. I want you to look in verse 12 and take a pen if you would. And I want you to circle the two words in prayer. You'll see there. And when you go back to in your devotions and your Bible reading over the next few months or even few years and you see that underline, you'll remember that and ask yourself, are you into prayer? And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now, I understand just talking about he was in prayer, but I want you to look at it a little bit deeper than that, and I want you to look at it. Was this kind of prayer that he was in was intense praying. This wasn't just quickly bow your head and pray for the food. This was an intense prayer. And when it was day, he called on the disciples, and of them he chose 12 of whom he named apostles. He was praying for something spiritual and something uh, uh, that he was going to choose his disciples, and he was in intense prayer with that. Take also at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And I want you to look down in verse, at, at, uh, verse 22. And likewise, take your pen, if you would. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now this isn't talking about I believe just a casual, Lord, I need this. I believe we're talking about something that states there is, there is a continual prayer. There, it's a passion. It's something that you enjoy doing. Prayer shouldn't be a pain to you. 
It should be something you do because it's on schedule to do. It should be something that you not only get to do, it's something you want to do. I want you to look at one other verse in Acts chapter 1, if you would please. Acts chapter 1, I want you to look in verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Philip and Andrew and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And it is believed that they were praying for, to, uh, for Matthew that, or Matthias that was going to be the added disciple. But nevertheless, these men were getting together, not just saying, fellas, let's just have a prayer, a prayer group tonight. Let's just gather together and uh, let's see what our needs are and pray for them. I think they were far more intense than that. This wasn't something that they just were made to do or were forced to do. It's something that they were into. Anyone can pray. Anyone can pray, but few are in prayer. Jesus taught the disciples, as Brother Colston read a few moments ago, on how to pray. And if you're going to get in prayer, you're going to have to understand some things. And in the very prayer that Jesus Christ gave and the sample prayer and the instruction, the first thing he, he taught them to do was to recognize their need, need for a personal relationship with God. What did he say? When you pray, pray, Our Father. Our Father. If you want to be a person and you want to get to a prayer life where you are into prayer and you're, you get in prayer, you're going to have to realize that, that God is your Father. There must be a personal relationship between you and Him. Amen. These disciples, had it was nothing for them to go and get in prayer. They knew Jesus Christ. They walked with Him. They talked with Him. They worked with Him. They listened to Him teach. And they were giving their lives to Him. Listen to me. Let me ask you something. I'm not trying to, to uh, question your salvation this morning, but maybe your prayer life is so shallow and your prayer life maybe is non-existent because you don't know Christ. God has never become your father. This relationship that, that uh, Jesus wanted his disciples to have in, the prayer, in their prayer life, when you pray, pray our father. In other words, this goes to a whole new level. A whole, it's not our friend, not our buddy, not our very good neighbor. Not my close comrade, but my father. Amen. Amen. There are things that I can talk about with my father that I cannot talk about with anybody else. Because no matter what I do or what I say, no matter my, even my father's attitude, he can never separate the fact that he's my father. Once I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and the blood that he shed for me that covered my sin, I was purchased and I was put into the family of God. And God then ceased to become a God, but he became my Father. And becoming my Father that allows me access to him in a, in a relationship and in a whole new realm and to where I can ask him things I probably wouldn't feel comfortable asking anybody else. I can say to, things to him that I wouldn't feel comfortable saying to anybody else. I can tell him things about my life and about, even though he knows everything, it feels good to talk about it. It feels good to say it to somebody. And God says, I don't want you to just to say them to me like I'm a priest hearing a confession. I want you to say things to me like I'm your father. I'm going to accept whatever you say. I'm going to help you. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to admonish you. I'm going to lead you through like a father would lead you. He said, recognize, you need to recognize the needs for a personal relationship with God. Is God your father today? Is God your father he said, Brother Eddie, these things have been so tough on my life, and, and I'm so nervous. I understand that. Have you gone to your father? Man, there were times in my life, and my dad's been in heaven for over 12, 13 years now, and, uh, but there were times that I'd just call my dad and say, he'd say, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know, I just wanted to hear you. Let me just, just hear you talk. 
Or, Dad, I don't, this is what I want to do. This is a car I want to buy. And, and, and let me run this by you. God wants to be that kind of person to you. He wants to be that father. You want to get in prayer. I, you never had to make me go talk to my dad. You never had to make me. He said, you need to spend time with your father. Nobody ever had to say that to me. It was something I enjoyed. And if you want to get in prayer, you need to develop a relationship with your heavenly father. And you notice Jesus didn't say your earthly father. He said your heavenly father. Our father, which art in what? Heaven. In what? Heaven. In heaven. Second thing, if you're going to get in prayer, Jesus said, hallowed be thy name. When you're talking to your heavenly father, you understand how big he is. How holy he is. Realize he is somebody that can answer anything you got. That heavenly father is not just a dad that's trying to make ends meet. He's not just a dad struggling to get by. He's not just a father that doesn't know exactly what he's going to do tomorrow, so he needs to go out and pray. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He created tomorrow. He's got it all scheduled out. He's got it all planned. We just got to realize who he is. And when you pray, you pray to your father, realizing that he is a hallowed person. He is big. He is strong. He is mighty. He is powerful. He's a very God spoken about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that created the heavens and the earth, and he can take care of your tomorrow. Amen. Well, Brother Eddie, what about our bills here at First Baptist Church? I don't care. That's my father's responsibility. Man, all the tithes and offerings coming in, hey, that's God's responsibility. That's his, that's his children. God may have to, to, have to rap on uh, the, the door of a few of his kids to get them to start tithing. I don't know. Well. Hallowed be thy name. When, I, when you pray, Jesus was teaching, uh, teaching the disciples, you listen to me. You put God in the place and you look at him like he is somebody respected, like you would respect your father, and you hallow him. He's strong, he's powerful and mighty. And tell you what, listen, what will happen ultimately is you will be humbled because who God is. People who pray are, are humble people. And praying allows us to humble ourselves and realize, you know what, I can't handle this all by myself. I'm not that big. I'm not that powerful. I'm not that strong. I was fishing with a friend in Canada a few several years ago. And he said uh, a few weeks earlier he was at the same lake and his buddy that was fishing with him had his boat and they were, he was uh, motoring by an island out there. It's uh, the islands and you kids uh, that have been on the eighth grade Boundary Waters trip, those little islands, just the same kind of area. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of islands and, and uh, rivers and so forth. Beautiful area. And this guy went past an island, and there was this teenage boy sitting on a rock. I mean, <clears throat> nobody else around, nobody else on this lake. There's only one, one uh, 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 landing into this lake, and it's on a little Indian town, that, um, and it's got a little bait shop, and, you know, you can buy, you know, some... Uh, uh, Ten-year-old Twinkies and Susie Q's and things like that, but that's all that's there. And so his uh, this guy he was he was riding by it and he saw this boy sitting there and he went on by about a half mile. And he, it got to bothering him because he didn't remember seeing a canoe, didn't remember seeing a boat. This kid didn't wave. This kid didn't try to flag him down. But it was an odd situation. So he turned around. He went back and he got, he motored up to the boy. He said, "Son, you okay?" He said, "Yes, sir." He said, I don't see a canoe, I don't see a boat. You here by yourself? I'm here by myself. He said, you okay? He said, yeah, I'm fine, sir. I'll be all right. He said, are, are you, are you going to stay here? What's going on? He said, well, there's some folks who are going to come get me in a little while. I'll be fine. You can go. And so he did. The next day, the, uh, the fellow went into that little town, that little bait shop, and was asking the store owner there about that odd thing that he'd seen out in this lake. And he said, oh, that happens all the time. He said, down the lake about three miles, there's a youth camp, and they, they take the kids in on a little, little flotation barge kind of thing and take all their supplies in. There's no electric in the camp. And it's a camp by an organization. I think it was maybe Outward Bounds or some organization like that that would take some uh, troubled youth out to camp out in the wilderness. 
And, he, and my friend said, well, that was odd, though. This kid was by himself. He wasn't with the group. He goes, oh, every once in a while, they get a boy that wants to run the camp. So they take him out and give him his own island for a day. <clears throat> they give him a gallon of water and a little bit of food to eat. And they, they drop him off in the morning, and they pick him up just before dark. And all day long, he gets to be his own boss. All day long, he gets to rule his world. And they find out when he gets back, he doesn't want to rule his world so much anymore. He's a little more tolerant of the rules of the camp, and a little more e he's a little easier to get along with. And we're like that, too. We want to rule our own world. We want to do our own thing. And we want to tell God what we need more than God says, you know what, why don't you just come to me? I'll help you know what you need. God, let me tell you who ought to be our pastor. God says, I already got him picked out. You just trust me. Well, this is the kind of pastor. I'm already getting letters from preachers. This is the kind of pastor First Baptist needs. You know, it, it, I throw those away. I've been throwing them away. I've been deleting them because God already knows what we need. God's been preparing somebody. God didn't say, well, you know what? Now I'm so confused. This church, you're going to be the death of me. Every time I get you rolling, you want to throw me a curveball. Now I got to get everybody together and I got to get a committee up here in heaven. We got to come up with something now. God's not doing that. We want to rule our own lives. We want to rule our own worlds. And we want to do our own thing. And God says, I want you to come and humble yourself before me and pray. Realize how big I am. Amen. Realize how powerful I am. Realize that I do have things in control. You say, Brother, why is it so important for me to get into prayer? Two reasons, and I'll go through them quickly this morning. Number one, because other, others need us to be in prayer. They need us. Your kids need us. Your family needs you. The Sunday school kids need us. My wife and I were yesterday at Cracker Barrel Restaurant. A lady I've never met before in my life. She worked in the kitchen. She came back and had her hair net on, and she came up. She said, Brother Lapina. I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, I just want to tell you I'm so sorry for what your church is going through, but I want to tell you something. She said, I want to thank you for your church, and I want to say that I'm praying for you, and God's going to be good to you. She said, my grandchildren ride your buses from Portage, Indiana. She said, Brother John Tutton got my, kids, got my grandkids to come to your church, and it's changed their lives. She says, I don't go myself. I said, well, we'll let you come, ma'am. She says, I know you would, but I'm praying for you. People need us. People need you to be in prayer today. They need you not just to be a prayer person. They don't need you just to put on the uniform. They don't need you just to put on the, uh, the, the baseball cap. They need you to get into it. They need you to study the craft. They need you to study Christ. They need you to study prayer and learn how to become a person of prayer and get into it. Anybody can put on a uniform and anybody can say, I'm in. Anybody can take a, and, and learn a song on a piano or a guitar and call themselves a musician. We don't need those kind of prayers. We need prayers that get, are getting into it and get in, involved with God and say, God, listen to me. We need to talk. And they have a relationship with their Heavenly Father. Others need us to do that. Look what Jesus said to Peter in uh, Luke chapter 22. But I have prayed for thee. And I tell you what, if Jesus were walking with me and face to face, say, Eddie, I'm praying for you. Woohoo! That'd be a lot. That'd mean everything. If I got Jesus praying for me and he tells me that verbally, you know what? I'm feeling pretty confident. He said, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Ironically, Jesus says, Peter, I'm praying for you because you know what? You're going to mess up, but when you get back on your feet, strengthen your brethren. And we, need, we all need people to be in prayer, don't we? When people are texting me and say, Brother Eddie, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I hope they're not just throwing out a flipping prayer. I'm hoping there are they're people that are in prayer. I'm hoping they can get a hold of God. I'm hoping they know God face to face. I'm hoping they have confidence in their heavenly Father and they hallow His name. I'm hoping they're men that are in prayer. 
I was preaching in Lafette, Georgia many years ago. I was reminded of this story last night as my wife and I stopped and visited Mrs. Boyd, Mrs. Don Boyd. And I was reminded of this story sitting there in her living room. Her son, Mark, was a graduate of Hammond Baptist High School. Mark got uh, a little out of sorts and actually he got pretty rebellious. Mark had a temper. He had a spirit that was pretty, pretty rough. His father, Don Boyd, principal of our high school, was, and was a man of prayer. He's in heaven today. But uh, Don Boyd, he prayed every morning. He prayed and prayed and prayed and had a just incredible prayer life. Mark had gone to Bob Jones University for a semester, maybe no more than a year. He quit and he went to Tennessee Temple and uh, wasn't doing well there. I was preaching not far from there and so I went to the campus and I knocked on his door in his dorm room. He was very surprised to see me. And uh, from what was going on in his dorm room, he was very surprised to see me. And I, uh, I said, Mark, I said, let's go, let's go uh, have something to eat. And we went to Pancake House. I know they're hard to find down that area, but we, uh, we found one, a Waffle House. And we sat there, and I said, Mark, how you doing? He said, not good. I said, what's going on? He said, I don't know, I'm struggling. And all of a sudden, he sat across from me, and his hands went on the table, and I'll never forget it. He said, Brother Eddie, I've got to tell you a story. I've got to tell you a story. He said, I went in a restaurant just a few days ago, and I was sitting there eating by myself and trying to figure things out. And he was struggling with a lot of issues and a lot of things in his life. And he said, and I was just sitting there eating, and a couple sitting right behind me tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, how you doing? And I said, fine. They said, uh, what's your name? I said, my name's Mark. And they struck up a conversation with me. I didn't really want to talk to them, but they began talking and we began to converse and they asked me where I was going to school and they kind of figured I was a college student. I said, I'm going to Tennessee Temple University here in Chattanooga. They said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And um, we're Christians. We're glad that you're going to a good college. And and he's, they asked him, said, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Hammond, Indiana. And they said, is that Jack Hiles Church? And he said, yes, it is. He said, oh, that's awesome. He said, um, he said what do your parents do? He said, my dad is principal of a high school at Hammond Baptist and works there for the ministry. And they said, well, we find it a little odd that you, went, you came from Jack Hiles Church, and we know they have a college there, Hiles Anderson College, and why didn't you go to their college? And Mark said, man alive, that'd be the last college I'd go to. He goes, I ain't going to that college. And they said, well, it's kind of odd that you would have that kind of spirit with your dad working there. He said, yeah, I know. He said, but there's just no way that college and me would fit. He said, I, I left high school. I went down to Bob Jones University, and I hated that place. It was boring. I didn't like it, and I, uh, I, I left it. And he goes, I'm at Tennessee Temple here, and I'm, I'm, I don't really care for it as well. And these, this lady looked at him and says, sounds like you're struggling with the Lord. Can we pray for you? Wow. Mark was kind at the time, and he finished and he paid. Uh, got up and he paid his bill and walked out of the restaurant. And if you know Mark Boyd, he's got a temper and it just hits him, comes all over him. And all of a sudden he got angry. They had no right to tell me that. They had no right to tell me they're praying for me. They're judging me. And he turned around. I mean, he was just outside the door a few feet, left before them. He turned around. And he looked all over that restaurant, went right back to the table. That couple wasn't there. He looked all over. They couldn't find him anywhere in that restaurant. Went by the bathrooms and walked into the men's bathroom. That man wasn't there. And stood outside the ladies. The lady never came out. Went out in the parking lot, couldn't find him. He said, Brother Eddie, that freaked me out. He said, what's going on? I said, Mark, you've got a problem. I said, I don't know who they were. I don't know if God sent them down to talk to you. I said, but I do know one thing for sure. You've got a praying dad at home. You've got a dad that is, that is not just a prayer person. He doesn't just have a prayer list. I said, your dad is into prayer. And I said, you're either going to get on or get off, but... God is talking to your dad, and your dad is talking to God about you every single day. I said, it's something you're going to have to face. 
wasn't but a year or so later, Mark came back, graduated from Howells Anderson. He's been pastoring down in Alabama for over 12 years. Others need us to be in prayer. You need to learn, dads, you need to get in prayer. Your kids need you to get in prayer. You need to set times and you need to set places and you need to set reminders to make yourself remember to pray. And you need to learn to get into it like you get into your television, like you get into your Facebook, like you get into your hobbies, you get into hunting, you get into fishing, you get into to, to, to basketball. You need to get into your prayer because your young people, your children need it. Others need it. Second reason you need to be in prayer is because it is a way for you and I to get close to Christ. It is the way to get close to Christ. Being close to Christ doesn't negate us from being hurt or suffering anything of, of, of uh, ill, but it does help us to deal with it. Because as long as we're praying and we know God is hallowed and we know God is our Father, everything is going to be all right. Many of you have turned to Facebook to find your answers. You're not going to find answers in Facebook. You're going to find, if you spend as much time in prayer as you've spent on Facebook lately, you'd have, you'd have been up here singing with John Matthewson. If you get despaired and you're worried about the future, it's because you're not spending time in prayer, getting to know God. Because the closer you get to God, and the more you get to know Him, the more comfortable you're going to be, feel about everything. If you're walking with bodyguards everywhere you, you go, you're not worried about a thug. When you're walking with God and you're praying to Him, you're not worried about the harms and the, 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 the ill things that will come and happen in your life. I mean, Peter had to have great comfort in his life when Jesus said, I'm praying for you. And then just a few days after the, or after the crucifixion, Jesus comes to him and says, Peter, you out fishing, come in here. And Peter, let me tell you that I'm going to be with you always. I'll never leave you. I'm going to be with you. You're going to do something great for me. And Peter finally bought into it that God wasn't going to fail him. God wasn't going to leave him. We need to get in prayer. Others' needs will be met if you get to know Christ. People will be strengthened by your prayer life. Your children will see dad standing firm and strong, not just attending church, but attending church with a power and a passion for Christ because he's in prayer. He's in prayer. I'll quit with this. I was told this story many, many years ago. Don't know if it's true, but it's a good story. <laughs> Young preacher started a church and had a small congregation, and, but he couldn't make it happen. It just wasn't going. There was no spirit. There was no, there was no connection with him and the people. And people would come and go, and new people would come and see it, and then they would leave. And there was, there was no building of the church. There was no synergy. There was no growth, no spirit. And he's trying and trying. His wife was a good godly lady. He was a good godly man, sincere heart and a passion for the Lord. Finally, after many, many, many months of trying and desperately trying to get his feet on the ground with his people in his church, he went to a seasoned preacher. And the pastor asked him about his prayer life, and he said, boy, I pray, preacher, and I try. And he goes, but it seems as if God doesn't hear me. We've all been there. He said, he seems like I'm praying to a wall or a ceiling, or I'm praying and my prayers are just going up into the heavens, and God isn't hearing me. This old preacher counseled him for a while and gave him a lot of great thoughts. But one of the thoughts he gave him, he said, asked him, he said, do you have a place to pray? He said, I do. I have a room in my house. I'd like to go pray. He goes, all right. He said, make that the place of prayer. And what preachers call it a prayer closet. May not be necessarily a closet, but a place that you can go to where nobody else is around and you're not trying to impress anybody and nobody's watching to see how you pray and you're not worried about what you say. You find a place where you go to pray. He said, I, I've got that kind of place and I know exactly what you're talking about and, and I'm going to do that. He said, second of all, he said, uh, he said, you know, when you pray, he said, he goes, this is what I like to do. He said, I've got a rocking chair. He goes, I like to be comfortable when I pray. And uh, some guys lie on their face. Some sit on their, get on their knees. Some, some sit in a chair. He goes, I sit in a rocking chair. He said, then go and buy yourself another rocking chair and place it right in front of you. And as you sit there and rock and pray, he goes, you pray as if somebody were sitting in that chair right in front of you. 
And this young preacher did. And all of a sudden, his sermons became inspired and powerful, and God was in them, and people began to get saved, and they got, they got ignited in the church, and they began, it began to grow, and he had a very successful pastorate. He was up in years, and every, every day, and not necessarily even at a scheduled time, he, Oft times he'd just tell his wife, I'm going to go up to pray for a while. And she'd say, fine. And she knew better than to, to, to disturb him and keep things away from him during this special time that he had with, with God. But in his later years, and, and uh, she was worried about him. And he'd been up in his prayer place quite a, quite a while. And she thought, maybe I ought to go and check, with, check on him. She tippy-toed up the stairs, and she put her ear to the door to see if, if he would pray. Quite often, he would, there would not be any sounds. He would be talking to God silently, and, or sometimes there was great noise. He was crying out to God. But she couldn't hear anything. She listened for the, the familiar sound of the rocking chair going back and forth. She didn't hear that. She creaked open the door to take a peek to see how he was doing, and she looked over, over at him and there he was sitting in his rocking chair. And he was lifeless. He had gone to heaven. As she walked into the room, she noticed something that was far different than before. The chair, rocking chair, that had been across from him all these many years. That helped him to pray to somebody that was actually there. was not there in front of him. It was next to him. And he was, his hand was on the arm of the rocking chair, open like this, as if he were holding the hand of somebody else. Here is a young man who had a heart for God that learned to pray, started out praying, and learned more about it, but he died in prayer. In prayer. Are you in prayer today? Is that something that you, you yearn for? Is that something you have a passion for? Do you fall apart at every evil thing or bad thing that happens to you? Or do you go to prayer? Do you run to Brother Douglas for counsel? And I'm not against you doing that, but did you go and pray first? Amen. Seniors in high school, I got to have my senior appointment with the preacher. I got to have my senior appointment. What's going to happen now? You ever thought about seniors praying? You ever thought about getting a couple of your buddies together and say, look, we're going to be graduating this next May, and uh, let's pray about our future. Amen. Have you ever taken a walk down the street from your house and say, God, I just, want you to, I just want you to be close to me. I just want you to be, as David said, as the apple of thine eye. I want you to hide me under the shadow of thy wings. I want you to be there with me. And God, listen, I don't need anything from you today other than the fact that you're there with me. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to get in prayer. We're going to get in prayer. Get to one of these prayer meetings. Get out by yourself. Get your family together. And, uh, you know, before you, you, you jump into your meal this afternoon, get your family to pray for this ministry in this church. Pray about your offerings. Pray about your tithes. Pray about the future of the mission teams. Pray. Get in prayer. Get in prayer. Otherwise, you will despair. Otherwise, you will fall apart because you just you have no idea how big God is, and you won't unless you learn to pray.